got your Bibles, we will be in John chapter 6 this morning. John chapter 6, continuing our, our study in uh, the Gospel of John. I've called One Way, showing uh, Jesus as that one way, not just one of many ways, uh, not a bunch of options, but as uh, the one way. And we're, we've closed out John chapter 6, and today we're going to be looking at the first 14 verses here. In John chapter 6, in a message I've entitled, Jesus Provides a Large Lunch. Jesus Provides a Large Lunch. So John chapter 6, starting in verse number 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed Him because they saw His miracles, which He did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain and sat there with His disciples. And the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Which shall we buy bread that these may eat? And he said, uh, and this he said uh, to prove him, for he knew him uh, himself, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two fishes. Uh, But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the uh, men to sit down. And now there was uh, much grass in the place, so the men sat down in the number, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when He had given thanks, He distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were sat down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled... He saith unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Uh, Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them which had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that a prophet should come into the world. So we're going to talk this morning about uh, Jesus provides a large lunch this lunch this morning. Excuse me. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I thank you for this day. God, I pray that you would use this message, that you would use this passage to work on our hearts this morning. Um, God, we need you. Um, uh, I can't present anything of myself that's going to help anybody here, but we need your Spirit to be poured out. We need your Spirit in this place. We desperately need a revival. We desperately need uh, to give attention to you, and we need to give attention to your word. God, I pray you'd use this message and that uh, it would minister to hearts this morning and that uh, you would pour your spirit out onto us and that we would leave here changed and we wouldn't just settle for going out the door the same way we went in. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the baptism this morning and, and the difference that you've made in that life already today. Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a story I came across about a man who was in an impossible situation. A situation where people needed to be fed, much like, obviously, that we read about where this morning where uh, this group had come to Jesus. And these people needed to be fed. This wasn't people looking for entertainment. They had a legitimate need. They needed to be fed. And there's a gentleman that tells a story the, uh, it goes this way, it says, The children are dressed and ready for school, but there is no food for them to eat. This was said by the house mother of an orphanage who, that was owned by a man named George Mueller. Mr. Mueller asked her then to take the 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the tables. And keep in mind, there was no food there at this point. He has them sitting at the tables And George Mueller thanked God for the food and waited. George truly believed that God would provide food for these children as he had always done previously. Within a few minutes, there was a baker who knocked on the front door of this orphanage. And the baker says, Mr. Mueller, last night I could not sleep, sir. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. So I got up and I baked three batches for you. I will bring it in. Soon after that, there was another knock on the door. It was the milkman. His cart 
would spoil by the time the wheel would be fixed because his cart had broken down right in front of the orphanage. So the milkman says, Sir, I, I need to get rid of this milk and, and, and could you please take this milk if we won't charge you for it because it would have been thrown out anyhow. And George smiled as the milkman brought in ten large cans of milk and it was just enough bread and it was just enough milk to feed these 300 children. We see here today... A, a impossible situation. And, and I want you to think with me this morning that you may be facing an impossible situation even though uh, perhaps all your food pantries are stocked or you have plenty of money in the bank to go to McDonald's or wherever you may want to eat at after church uh, that, that we consider that this morning this is more than just feeding people. This was an impossible situation that Jesus worked very, very, very much in this morning. We see first of all The first point for study, we need to consider in these first three verses the crowd at the lunch. The crowd at the lunch. As Jesus provides this large lunch, we see the crowd here. Verses 1-3 through tell us, And after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed Him, because they saw His miracles, which He did on them that were diseased. By the way, verse number 2 For this week and the next few weeks, pay very close attention to how this is worded here and why they followed Him. Verse 3, Jesus went up into a mountain and there sat with His disciples. We see here the crowd at the lunch. The Passover was fast approaching and this was an intentionally, intensely, excuse me, nationalistic celebrational day for people in Israel. This explains the extreme zeal that many uh, could... uh, Uh, many of the Jews demonstrated as they thought they could draft Jesus into being their uh, political deliverer. Uh, Because we need to keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that these people were waiting for Jesus to pop on the scene. But they they had looked, when they thought Jesus was going to pop on the scene, they thought it would be another coming of Moses. They thought it would be another coming of King David. Uh, Men who God raised up, and perhaps even the judges as well. People that God had raised up for the purpose of giving political deliverance to. They thought they were going to be delivered from the tyranny of the Roman government. They wanted to draft Jesus and make Him fit their agenda. May we not make the same, same mistake this morning. May we not think, well God, I'm, I, I, I realize that what Your Word says, but I really need You to, to kind of fit into my box and fit into my mold of what I think You should do and how I think You should work at Mount Zion Baptist Church and how I think You should work in my family and how I think You should work at Your job. If we're not careful, we can be doing the same thing that these people here did. These people were fair weather followers, as I call them. Jesus was popular as He was doing things no one else could do at this point in time. Matthew chapter 4, verse 24 tells us, And His fame went throughout all Samaria, and they brought unto Him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those possessed with devils, and those that which were with the lunatics, and those that had palsy, and He healed them. It's easy to praise Jesus when everything's going good. It's easy to praise Jesus when, man, every bill's getting paid. Man, I can go do what I want. Man, it's exciting. Woo! I can praise Jesus when it's exciting. It's easy to praise Jesus when perhaps every seat in your Sunday school class is full. It's easy to uh, praise Jesus perhaps when every pew is occupied by somebody. But friends, regardless of how good or bad a situation is, We need to follow God. We need to be praising Him. He's worthy of it. No matter what happens, whether we have two or we have 200 here, we need to be thanking God for the opportunity He's given us to to, uh, uh, minister in. It's sometimes not easy to praise God when there's a mess back in the fellowship hall, maybe. I've got to thank God. I'm not preaching to anybody else right now. I need to thank God for that mess because that means there were people here that heard about Jesus. Perhaps maybe you teach a group and there might be one in there. Thank God for the one soul that you have that opportunity with. These people had interest in the miracles. They were not just only fair weather followers. They had interest in the miracles. These people were drawn to a spectacle of ministry. They were amazed and on some level entertained 
And oh, that was never Jesus' intent. Jesus didn't come here and say, well, I'm going to spice things up and, and entertain you and give you cotton candy worship and give you stuff that makes you feel good and feel warm and fuzzy inside. That wasn't Jesus' intent. Obviously, I'm not against worship music. But friends, we need to be very, very careful that we realize the intent Jesus had here. When He was doing these miracles, it wasn't so people could just Woo! Have a good time. It was, it was really to humble people and realize I'm in this situation and I'm broken. And Jesus didn't have to heal me, but He healed me. That was what He wanted to do. Sometimes I think if we're safe for a long period of time, we easily can lose sight of our brokenness. We easily can forget about the ditch God picked us up out of. Because sometimes we think, boy, yep, yes sir, I've been serving God for X amount of years. That be my Bible. I'm singing the songs. I've got uh, 88.3 the wind on in my car. Man, uh, I don't let any of that ungodly stuff in my car or in my house. I'm doing pretty good. Nothing against the wind, by the way. But my point is this. When was the last time that we really thought about the place we deserve? When was the last time we thought about the, the great love of God that was demonstrated to pull us up out of an eternal flaming hell and set us on a different direction? May we not have to really think back super hard to that this morning. And I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm saying this to say we can very easily lose sight of the love of God this morning if we're not careful. Because... As much as I try to love you, as much as this great church tries to love you, it doesn't compare to the love of God. And we also need to be reminded this morning of the love of God, because as Paul wrote, wrote about in Romans, that the love of God is shown abroad in your hearts. What he's saying there is the love of God deeply moves you to service. It deeply moves you to how you treat one another. It deeply moves you for how you treat your family. It deeply moves you how to treat your brothers and sisters in Christ. Number two this morning, we see the cause for the lunch. We've seen the crowd, how this crowd was, was, a, was a fair weather following crowd. We're going to talk more about that in this chapter later. We've seen that these people had interest in miracles. They had interest in spectacle. Boy, people like to watch a good sports team, don't they? One that, man, uh, that guy sure hit that ball 435 feet. Or, wow, he sure ran fast for that touchdown. Or, man, she gave a mean backhand uh, along the tennis court. And we're so amazed sometimes at a spectacle. People pay to go watch a spectacle. Jesus didn't want the spectacle. We see the cause for the lunch. Look at verses, verses four through nine with me. And the Passover, the feast was nigh. Or, uh, the Jews, excuse me, was nigh. And when Jesus had uh, lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, "Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat?" Which, by the way, is Jesus at the mercy of Apple Market or Sam's or Walmart? No. Verse six. And this he said to prove him, for he knew in himself what he would do. Right there, verse 6 tells us that Jesus didn't need these guys to make a run to Sam's. He was trying to reveal what was there. Look at verse 7 with me. And Philip answered, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Philip is saying here, a Sam's Club trip isn't even going to cut it, Jesus. We don't have enough money. Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? The crowd was thinking of terms here of blood and flesh and lambs and unleavened bread. They were waiting for a new Moses or a new David that would deliver them from the bondage of the Roman army and Roman government. The Passover here would remind them of Moses. And these miracles stirred their interest in Jesus so much that they stopped what they were doing. 
These people put down what they were doing and decided to, we're going to go see what's going on here. I'm going to put down my axe. I'm going to put down my, my gathering of, of my harvest so that I can go and I can see what this is going on here. And I can see what's going on with these miracles. And, and, and man, we like to see stuff, don't we, that's, like I said earlier, that's kind of a spectacle, stuff that's uh, uh, it's, it's interesting and, and maybe even entertaining to watch somebody with some skills and abilities. And that's what we see here. But notice here this cause for the lunch. Jesus saw with this cause for the lunch, Jesus saw a needy people. Jesus saw people that, that needed bread. And he also saw that they had some spiritual needs as well. Matthew 14, 14 says, Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them. And he healed their sick. You know what? Jesus sees a needy people today. Jesus sees a needy people right in our community. Brother Josh, there's a lot of churches. I'm sure there are a lot of churches. But we have a mission right here. God has given us a commission right here to try to reach some people and make a difference. Or Mark, excuse me, 8, 2 through 4 says, I have compassion on the multitude because they have been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away uh, fasting to their own homes, they will faint by the way. The diverse of them, uh, for diverse of them came from afar. And his disciples answered, said, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? So Jesus is pointing out that there's a, a need here. These guys are saying, Jesus, we're we we're, 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 we're have no resources. We can't do anything about it. We don't know what to do. What, what, what can we do? And we might have a situation in our lives today where we might be thinking, what can I do? What can I do about a class that needs a teacher? What can I do about needing to reach some teenagers? Perhaps you have a situation in your personal life and you may be like one of these disciples not trying to argue, but simply state the obvious and, and, and wonder what Jesus is going to say in response. And you wonder, what can I do? You've got to get Jesus involved. You may not have that need of a large lunch, but boy, you may have a large burden this morning. I can't meet that, that burden. Only Jesus can do that. The disciples had no answers on this need. Matthew 14, 15 says, When it was evening, His disciples came to Him saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves uh, victuals or food. So we've, seen, we've got a problem here. Jesus has stated that if we send these people away, they can't get there. They're going to faint if we send them away and say, go get your own food. Go pay for your own McDonald's. And we'll make it. Some of the disciples think, boy, if we just get rid of the problem here, out of sight, out of mind, sometimes that's the easy way. John illustrates for us that Jesus' question here, according to verse number 6, was a test in Philip's discipleship training to, to this point. There's no indication that Jesus was wondering what to do. There's no indication that Jesus was, was, uh, was uh, in duress. You know, we, we, might, we might be overcome with anxiety. We might wonder, what am I going to do? We've got this crowd of people and no way to feed them. Jesus was cool as a cucumber this whole time. Uh, a time where it would be very reasonable... For us to wonder, well, we're in, a, we're in a place that's a wilderness. Another passage says this is like a desert. Is there, is there a place to get bread out in the middle of the desert? Not usually. And we didn't have a 7-Eleven down the corner on, on every main road back in those days. Some of you may not even know what 7-Eleven is. <laughs> Last time I was at a 7-Eleven was when I was in Oklahoma and you could get the big gulp. Yeah, the big gulp. You couldn't go get the big gulp down some road. They're in a wilderness. They're in a desert place. A place where there's not a lot of sign of life. You may be here today and you may feel like 
Physically, you're not in a desert. Physically, you're not in a wilderness. But you may feel like what you're going through, where you feel like you're in a wilderness. You might feel isolated. You might feel like there's no life or vibrancy around you right now, spiritually maybe. We're going to see that Jesus meets this answer. Philip thought in terms of money here, how much money it would take to carry out God's work in a small way here. Philip wasn't, Philip was trying to reason this out. He was saying, he was thinking, he was trying to do a quick calculation of how much money it would take. 200 denarii represented about eight months worth of wages. As Philip put his mental calculator together, he realized eight months worth of wages isn't going to feed these people. Because there were so many of them. We often limit God the same way, feeling like God is maybe somehow poor, limited, and perhaps even uninterested in the issues of life. If you're hurting this morning, Jesus wants to hear about it. If you are hurting emotionally, if you are hurting physically, if you're hurting mentally, Jesus wants to hear about it. Don't think it's a burden to pray about something that's bothering you this morning. This is the time to do it. If you've got a burden, you've got something just that, that, that you just know needs to change, you, you know you perhaps need to do something, or, or you're just hurt, it, may not even, it might be the result of someone else's choices. Right now, today is the day to release that to the Lord and turn it over to Him. Philip is thinking, boy, humanly speaking, Philip says these eight months of wages aren't going to get the job done. And you know, Philip wasn't wrong. I think Jesus wanted Philip to see, boy, these eight months of wages sure isn't going to feed everybody. I think He wanted Philip to see that so that Philip would realize, guess what, we have to have a God moment here. We've got to have a God hug where God miraculously provides. Andrew brings the smallest option to the table here. Probably the fish would have served as some type of relish to eat with the bread. So even though I've got a graphic of, of bread and, and, and some fish there, that it was probably, because uh, the young man had it packed, it was probably like a relish and served as some type of relish to eat with the bread. The barley bread was the food of the poor. Most of the time it was given to animals. 1 Kings 4.28 expresses where, what would usually happen with the barley when it says this. Listen closely. The barley also and straw for the horses and uh, dromedaries, which was uh, another word for camel, brought they into the place where the officers were, every man according to his charge. So that passage right there tells us in those days how the barley was used. So we had a, a, a young man, a boy, who has a, who's got his lunch in his lunch pail. He's got the fishes and the bread. Somehow Andrew finds out about him. And he presents the least, what seems like the least likely option. I kind of want to jump ahead of myself, but I need to announce my next point, which is, thirdly, the child used at the lunch. The child used at the lunch. We've seen the crowd at the lunch. We've seen the cause for the lunch. This crowd was a, it was a crowd seeking after Jesus. We've seen this cause that because they had been pursuing Him, they grew weak, which by the way, as you pursue Jesus, there is a cost. You may grow weary. But you don't want to grow weary. It's not because God's trying to punish you. When we grow weary, it's so we stay dependent on Him. Thirdly and lastly this morning, we see the child used at the lunch. Verse number 10, Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. Boy, there's a reason Scripture says this here. Does anybody like sitting on rock? I've done some firearms training at an old quarry north of Bolivar. I have to get down on my knees at that place to pick up the brass. It isn't too fun crawling around an old rock quarry picking up brass from your bullets, from 9mm bullets. You get up and, man, I feel like I'm 900 years old crawling on my 
hands and knees picking that stuff up. But enough about that. I want you to see that as Jesus had these people sit down, He had them sit down on grass. Go have a picnic sometime in an area where it's thick grass. Not just patches of grass, but where it's real thick grass. It's soft to sit on, is it not? Jesus, from, from reading this, Jesus considered that He wanted them to sit in a soft spot, but we need to continue on. So the, man sat, the men sat down in number of about 5,000, and Jesus took the loaves, and when He had given thanks, He distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were sat down, and likewise the, of the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled... He said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them twelve baskets together, and with the fragments of the barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, excuse me, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that a prophet should come into the world. Jesus calls the least likely person to be used to provide this lunch. You may think, Brother Josh, I don't have anything to contribute to this church. Every single person in this room today isn't here by mistake or by accident. And I believe God has brought you here not just to watch somebody get baptized, not just to hear the songs that are sang, not even just to hear a sermon, but I believe God wants to gather you here in this place to build His church. Because this is His church. It's not mine. It's not anyone else's. There's some people that have labored so we have a nice facility, but it doesn't belong to them. God wants to use you right here. God wants to use me. You don't understand. I've not been to Bible college. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Well, don't you have to go to Bible college? No, not necessarily. In some instances, it's, that might be a good thing you didn't go because you're going to depend on the Lord and not depend on your education. And I'm not against education. The least likely person. We don't know this child's name. But I believe he probably went away from this lunch probably telling people about what Jesus did with what little bit he gave him. All he had was this small lunch. And you may say, Oh, Brother Josh, all I have to give is my time. All I have to give is this. Give it. Give what you can give. A healthy church is... Is, is full of people that are, that are investing themselves into what's going on. Jesus places everything in a strategic way here. 1 Corinthians 14.40 tells us, Let all things be done decently and in order. Sometimes we want to doubt or question things when God is setting everything in order before everything unfolds. You know, a year ago, this time, I knew God was done with me at First Baptist Church of South Greenfield. I didn't understand it. I'd been there for five and a half years. I'm not going to list all the stuff I did or tried to do, but all I'm going to say is it was hard for me to accept that God was done with me at a place I'd been for five and a half years. And if you've done ministry very long, you know what it's like to serve somewhere for length of time. And I, and I thought, where are you going to take me, God? And it was scary for a few weeks of that. But God was beginning to do some things at Mount Zion Baptist Church and in the life of Josh Hall at that point in time. Sometimes we don't see that God's strategically moving things around and moving people around. And I don't know about you, but I want, I want God to, to, to move me around to do His will and to do uh, uh, what, what He wants me to do. Sometimes we don't see the strategy of God until after the fact. And we can look back and be like, wow, I knew what you were doing, God, because if I had done it my way, it would have gotten messed up pretty quick. And God's like, yep, that's why I'm in charge and you're not. It's been suggested that Jesus seated them also to discourage the people from rushing madly for the food once they realized what exactly was going on. You ever seen this at some places? You, you put food out and boy, there's people doing this or doing that. I, I took the kids to a, a, a little place where uh, Easter eggs were dropped from a, from a helicopter. And boy, they had this drop zone and the helicopter's going over and everybody's, everybody's there and these kids are elbowing each other on the line. And those, those, those uh, Easter eggs got dropped and man, it was, 
Woo! The, the first wave of the older kids and then the younger kids kind of came behind them and there was even though the person with the microphone said, we're going we're gonna to be kind to our neighbor next to us and we're not going to push and shove, well, the moment those Easter eggs hit that grass, that order went out the window. Once again, Jesus knows what He's doing. God knows what He's doing. Jesus gave thanks. Jesus first thanked God for the food, and He sets the example here to give thanks for everything, no matter the size that God had provided. Loss of our joy starts at not giving thanks and bitterness stems from not giving thanks. Whether I'm with a handful of people or we've got this place packed out, I've seen both. I give God thanks. I'm thankful God has put me here. I'm thankful we have a, we're going to have a work day. Do I like to get out and work? No. But I'm thankful we have an opportunity to do something for the Lord here and to do something to further the ministry here. I like sleeping in on Saturdays probably more than anyone in this room. But I'm thankful for the opportunity. I'm going to pass out some flyers here once I get them printed up. And I'm thankful to go out and pound the pavement and be able to have a church to invite people to where we can love them and we can tell them the truth about Jesus and try to be an encouragement to somebody. I've just noticed in my life, this isn't at anybody or towards anybody, but if I'm not thankful, I get, I get a little attitude going on if I'm not thankful. And then I, when I'm not thankful, I don't realize the blessings God's put in my life. Jesus prays here in perfect confidence that God would meet every physical need here. This is a good lesson for us. Instead of complaining about what we don't have, we should give thanks according to Warren Worsby. Warren Worsby says this is a good lesson. Instead of complaining about what we don't have, we should give thanks for, to God for what we do have and He will make it go further. You know, I had a pastor that I sat under one time and he went to his wife and he said this in a sermon, so I'm not bad-mouthing the guy. He said this in a sermon, so uh, you can go back for, I don't know, probably 20 years ago and listen to his sermon, you'll hear him saying this. He was complaining to his wife about the attendance that Sunday. And his wife said, uh, so-and-so, why aren't you thankful for the X amount of people that did show up? And boy, when he heard that, he felt conviction come on him like a ton of bricks. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Sometimes we run around, what's the will of God? God, what do you want me to do over here? Uh, uh, I see a need over here, God. I've got to start by giving thanks. Jesus exceeded the need here. The supply seemed inexhaustible. 10,000 plus happy people. We see 5,000. It just mentions men. Most commentators will tell you it's about 10,000 plus. They were happy people. They were enjoying the feast that Jesus had spread out for them. Psalm 81.10, and we're almost done, uh, says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. So the psalmist is explaining here, as he's writing this psalm, that, that the, God, the same God that brought you out of Egypt, the same God that brought you out of deliverance, is the same God that's going to provide for you. And friends, the same God that saved you is the same God that wants to provide in your situation. He's the same God that wants to use you here at Mount Zion Baptist Church. One liberal theologian suggests this boy's offering of his lunch embarrassed the adults that uh, they went and brought their own lunches instead. Doesn't that sound crazy? This is nonsense as Jesus saw these people's needs and knew exactly what would have happened if they didn't have a large lunch provided that they would have fainted. But they had physical needs. It was not, it was, Jesus wasn't trying to entertain and He knew that this wouldn't just entertain them. He knew that they need to be sustained physically. They were there to receive, though. They were not there to give. The people see what Jesus had done, and they may say, Wow, this is one who is promised in Deuteronomy 18 to Deuteronomy 19, that great prophecy of Moses. This is a man that's perhaps mightier than Moses, our deliverer, 
our Messiah. Perhaps it is Him. In closing, at one time, P.T. Barnum, if you know about P.T. Barnum, he was uh, the head of the Barnum and, Barnum and Bailey Circus. In fact, Hollywood did a movie about him called The Greatest Showman. He invited Charles Spurgeon of London to come speak at one of his large traveling circuses. Isn't that interesting? A man who was in the entertainment business wanted to bring Charles Spurgeon, a man who was called the Prince of Preachers, to preach at one of these circus meetings. He made a very... Um, he made every attempt here to make the offer attractive to Mr. Spurgeon. Barnum would provide the musical talent unless Spurgeon wished to bring his own. He would provide any equipment or manpower that Spurgeon desired. He said, Spur Mr. Spurgeon, I'm going to provide anything you want so you can come preach at one of my circus meetings or circus events. Spurgeon could speak for as long or as short as he wished. He's, what, what, what an invitation to preacher. What preacher wouldn't turn this down? You've got a room full of people. You can speak as long as you want or short as you want. But he made one concession here. There was one stipulation. The Barnum and Bailey Circus Association would take the gate receipts and pay Spurgeon $1,000 per lecture. It's a lot of money in those days. This was a generous offer. Many would have said, what a wonderful opportunity to show the gospel with a bunch of people with a captive audience. That wasn't Spurgeon's approach, though. Knowing it would be wrong to join hands with, with a worldly venture like this, he wrote a reply to Mr. Barnum. He said, Mr. Barnum, thank you for your kind invitation for me to come speak at your circus tents in America. You will find my answer in Acts 13.10, very sincerely yours, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. If Mr. Barnum had taken the time to look up Acts 13.10, he would find these words, O full of all subtility and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all unrighteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? It is sad that not all believers have that conviction. That was these people's attitude about entertainment the crowd. But yet at the same time, there's a need. And Spurgeon even knew there was a need. But he wasn't going to go the entertainment route to take the need of Jesus. He knew that, that a crowd was needing Jesus, just like this crowd here did today. I'm going to pray, and we'll have a time of invitation. And perhaps today, you're that one. Maybe you need that large lunch. I don't mean the, the, the physical lunch. I mean, you need something to sustain you spiritually. And only that relationship with Christ is going to do that. Maybe you have a burden. I can't bear your burden. I can pray with you. But really, Jesus is the one that's to bear that burden. He's the bear, burden bearer. Not me. Not anyone else. Not a televangelist. Not even a church. Or maybe you need to make a decision today. Just like that little boy made a decision that he was going to serve God by giving up that lunch. He didn't know what these people were going to do with his lunch. He was putting himself in kind of a predicament himself. He had enough food to feed himself, but guess what? He didn't keep it to himself. He gave it to God, and God used it. You may have, The only thing you have to give to God this morning might be your life and your time to be used. And I guarantee you, God will take you and use you in ways you can't possibly imagine. Maybe you need to get baptized. Maybe you need to join this church this morning. Let's pray.